Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. Coaches, we are all searching for ways to better evaluate players in order to give meaningful feedback. Over 15 years ago, I put together a test called the Jamoti Skill Rating. The JSR takes players through a series of tests involving basketball skill or athleticism, giving them one rating at the end. Their JSR rating will give you clarity on what needs to be discussed with players and parents on areas they need to focus on improving. I test our players at least four times each year. They're able to compete against each other, pass players' scores, and most importantly, their past performances. If you'd like to start testing your athletes, email me at jamotipodcast at gmail.com for more information. What's the balance there, Coach, with... Obviously, yeah, the goal is, and there are moments that you just got to nail. I mean, like you said, when you're putting in something new, you've got that. It's almost like a job interview, almost like every day where you that first impression, you, you got to nail it. But there's also, I, I think, sometimes where like we are human, we're going to make mistakes and, and, and owning that mistake in front of your team. What's the balance there? Like as far as, I mean... I, we're going to make mistakes. Do we just breeze past that my way or the highway or, or guys, let's say, you know what? I don't like that. Uh, we're, we're going to do something else. What are your thoughts? One of our sayings, we have a lot of, I call them daily isms, but one of them was uh, you can't fool dogs, kids or NBA players. Okay. Uh, you know, and, and, and the idea was, you know, if like when I was in LSU, I had Ben Simmons, who was by far the best player I ever saw at that age coming into the NBA. Wow. And the, so the first day I was with him, we were going to go to Australia in the summer for, on a tour. And I'm teaching them how to hedge on a pick and roll drill. And I'm teaching the drill that the head coach wanted. I taught it the next day. I'm reviewing it. And Ben Simmons, who has a basketball genius IQ, hmm. says, Coach, you said this yesterday. And I said, you're 100% right. My fault. And I, admit, I immediately said, you're right. Thank you, for, thank you for pointing that out to me. We got back to the coach's locker room afterwards. And my head coach at the time, uh, who I love dearly, said, don't ever do that again. He said, don't ever, ever tell the player you made a mistake. I said, Johnny, I've been doing this for X amount of years. I've been in the NBA for 35 years. I'm going to tell him every damn time I make a mistake. Yeah. Because otherwise, I'd lose my credibility with him. Yeah. Oh, you can't do that. You can't. I said, no, you must do that. It's just the opposite. You must. Hey, I've made a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes coaching. And you know what? Sometimes after a game, I'll say, hey, you know what? I, my philosophy is to foul when we're up three. My philosophy is to foul so that they don't get to shoot a three. Shame on me that I didn't stay with my beliefs. Mm. And they, because they all know my beliefs and they're all, and you know what? And so every now and then you have to take responsibility because that, I call it, it's not you made a mistake. I made it, I'm right. It's collective responsibility. We win, we lose together. Yeah. And if it's not, the coaches that when they lose, they point the fingers at their players. No respect for them, to be honest with you. Mm. Even though some of them are big name guys and stuff like that, or gals, you can't be like that. You know, as a dad, have you ever made a mistake in raising your children? Of course. Right? Of yeah. course. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. And, and if you raise kids as old as my kids are, you made a lot of darn mistakes. Okay. And you know what? And they know you did. But you know what? Raise your hand. And How do you what? expect them to? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. How do you expect them to if you don't? And, and thinking of the players, you know, and, and I'm getting farther and farther away from remembering what it felt like to play. But we want our players to play courageously, to to take wise chances, right, on, on the floor. And 
there has to that uh, to me that attitude it's created uh, in practice the way that you respond sure. to those mistakes the environment that you created with that like level of trust that we're talking about uh, it, when you acknowledge that you make a mistake and you show them how to handle that when they make a mistake they know how to handle it uh, my fault coach uh, next one i got this you know they we create that yeah i think it's really important we actually teach that and we'll say to players when you make a mistake there's so many players that would say oh it's my fault my fault you know no forget that you don't have time to do that just next play and we tell the four other teammates when a guy throws the ball out of bounds and stuff they are coached to tell him next play mm. you know like help him get back in the game and you body language wise don't react as some of my friends do when a mistake is made they go like oh look at my player messed up i have nothing to do with it no no just uh, watch my friend billy donovan on the sideline with the bulls his players will make some of the worst plays ever <laughs> And that guy never changes his expression. Man. Eric Spolster, same way. Coach, that's hard. That's yeah. hard. Yeah, but it's important because you don't want to be – how about when you call a bad play, the player goes, what are you doing? <laughs> how stupid are you? <laughs> right? You know, I, we, we as coaches never look at no it doubt. the other way around. Yeah. And, and you, know, uh, you know, I think it's really important that we teach body language is so important for coach and for players. A lot of assistant coaches have terrible body language when one of their players makes a mistake, mm. you know, and uh, or or with a referee's bad call. Can't have it, you know. Man, I, I think that's a great action step for coaches to do, not just this time of year in the spring and summer where it's improvement season, not just for players, but for all of us, is to go back and watch games and and not necessarily what's happening in front of you, but watch watch yourself on the side. At our school, we we utilize the three point shot as a weapon, not only to obviously score points, but to create the space that we want to make mm -hmm. the paint really open for us to get to. And so, but what I real in order for my guys to shoot with courage, they have to know that if it's within our shot selection scale, that make or miss, I approve of that shot. It's not that they have to, I have this written down. It's not that they have to uh, make it, but it's that they have to take it like that type of mentality. But what I realized is without me saying like, make a shot, my body language was showing how I felt. So if if we took a shot that was is great within our shot selection scale, but we missed it, I would just slightly like kind of hunch over or even go just sit down. Coach, I didn't say quit. I, I love like as a team that shoots a higher volume of threes, I love when the parents or fans will stop shooting threes <laughs> not if they're the right shot for us it doesn't matter what happened in the past but that's just but coach when i sit down is that me being supportive of our guys shooting with courage or is that me being frustrated that we haven't made more and i'm resulting in that moment frustrated. just we got to yeah. watch we got to watch yeah, ourselves yeah you're being frustrated at that because you you don't want to yell you don't want to do that but you're saying I'll sit my ass down here and then maybe no one will notice, but they notice that you stand up coaching all the time. So they'll notice that you sat down. Well, why <laughs> you sit down? Yeah. I mean, it, no, it, it, and you know, so I, I, I like the Steve Kerr thing that, you know, he sits down a lot and then he stands, but if you do one or the other all the time, then when you, when you change, you know, one of my friends stands coaches standing up, well, he's getting his butt beat by 20 in the NCAA tournament. He sat down. And so immediately I said he gave up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So you, your people observe you. And you're, well, forget the people. I could care less about them, but your players. That's no doubt. Those are them. the people I think we're talking about for that's sure. That's the ones. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, so one of the things you could do, uh, little Johnny took a shot. That's one you want him to take. He's a great shooter. He's wide open. It's a good shot for Johnny. He missed it. He shot a freaking air ball. It don't matter. 
you know what you do? That's clap for them. And that's what, that's what, you know, it's kind of like, that's what I want to do. That's yeah. who I want to be. I acknowledge I'm not there yet, but it's blind spots. Like yeah, if you don't, don't watch every time film, one of your guys right. misses a shot, I don't, but if it's a good shot, <laughs> yes. he's now in, and he misses it. He's a maybe embarrassed, but you know, as he runs back, you say, Hey, good shot. That's yeah. it. You, Next. You, you know, you're wide open. Keep taking that, you know, mm -hmm that little encouragement because if he hesitates the next time he definitely will miss i i want to value your time the controlled scrimmage yep i have a couple questions about that um sure. love the idea of it being a, a small or a, a short small score uh you're right like one question that i get to ask coaches what would you do differently if you could start over and a lot of a lot of answers are scrimmage more in practice but not all scrimmage time is the same. And so you want to, whatever we're, we choose to do with our hour, our hour 15, we want it to really be a, a value to our players and our team. So um, when we started coaching um, back in my day, uh, in the, you know, when we weren't in season, we would go up to the playground and we would play outdoors. We'd play Half court, we'd play one on one, two on two, three on three, five on five. We had enough guys. Nowadays, players don't play. Yeah. Now, rich kids, they got trainers, college players, trainers. So, what I'm finding now is college, high school, sometimes high school, but college players, pro players, they don't know how to play five on five. Mm. So I need to have them play five on five to learn how to play five on five. And none of them, there's not been a player I've seen in X number of years that in the off season, his trainer works on them with on defense. So coach, you try to market that. yourself as an individual defensive skills coach. You're going to have zero clients. No, you have no clients. You have no clients. No, you're not. You, you may, your wife wouldn't even send you to. That's you know, right. I mean, she wouldn't even right. send your kid there. No, that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, you'll be doing free lessons, and no that's, one will show up. Probably, that's right. You know, after the first practice, and so I think it's important that uh, that you really teach them how to play five on five, and I, and. You know, all these college programs, they go, oh, come to our place. And great player development. Oh, just what we need. Great player development. How about great team development? Hmm. Okay. Because we don't get to practice offense, defense. So, you know, you you have players that you're coaching defensively, unless you're allowed to have team camps. Are you allowed that? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. So if you have a team camp and you can practice – uh, and then your high school season, that's the only time you get to practice defense at all, you know? <laughs> so, and yet you, you want to be a great defensive team, you know? Uh, yeah. It's really hard to because eight months of the year, they're not guarding anyone. That's true. The, the, so you played it too at that level, um, either even college, but at the NBA, did you have consequences for the losing team or was Absolutely. the competition just enough? Okay. No, no. Uh, you know, what we would do, at, you know, if whatever, you know, we either in the time was over, we would keep the score. And, and the only score was if you got two points and if you had two and I had one, it didn't matter if I had one, it didn't matter. Might as well have had none. You won. So you have won. And, and then at the end, you know, we'd have run and, and let's say, for instance, you have one team that's not competing. Let's just say, and one team's won uh, fourteen games, and the other team's won three. Then I might have them do X amount of sprints or whatever running drills I do, maybe with a ball, even or whatever, to get them running, to let them know that winning is important, mm -hmm. you know. But nothing painful or punishment. Sure. But I, I think there has to be. I think and the biggest thing and, and the reason I like this is because we would also call it I think I think it's important 
even at the high school level, even if you have five good players and no one else can crack the starting lineup, that you have what I call on non-game days, competition days. Mm -hmm. So that the reason that we do this is that we allow you to compete. And if you compete, make me play you. You compete, you get better. I'm playing you. Because you know what you did? You showed me that you can play. Mm -hmm. You're getting better. And so it gives them hope. And I think that's one of the great things that you need in coaching is to give hope to your team, but more importantly to the guys that don't get to play as much. Hmm. And now that during the year, I can actually get better and earn playing time. So I think that's really important. But co competition is one of the greatest things because a lot of kids nowadays do not want to compete. They run from competition. Portals. <laughs> things don't go well. Put my name in a portal. High school. Kids go to change schools. Yeah, transfer. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, AAU, I don't get any shots. I'm going to play in another team the next week. You know, I, you know, and so I, I think it's important that we teach kids to compete and handle adversity and all that good stuff. To everything you just said, it seems to me like having the at, at being loyal, loyalty may end up being a really valuable commodity now as a player especially at the college level where you talked about the portal where if, if you're a player that maybe didn't play a lot but you stick around even if they're going to bring in new guys from the portal you knowing the system a coach knowing that they can depend on you i could see loyalty now being you know if people say that uh being competitive is a skill now, or effort is a skill now that has to be taught. It's not natural. Loyalty maybe now is a skill that might really help some of these players. Well, it's one of those qualities that everything good in life happens, whether it's a husband-wife relationship, boyfriend-girlfriend, family relationship where people, you know, we know people in families that are not loyal to their brothers, sisters, or mom and dad, you know. Uh, so to teach them those things, to teach them how to be, you know, we believe that, you know, in mental and physical toughness, you know, uh, but the mental part was so important. But I, I think those are part of all the life lessons, Matt, that we have to teach yeah. our people, you know, and we always said that, you know, you know, people say, well, how do you have a great team? And and you only have a great team, not if I'm coaching it. It's about internal leadership on the team. So if your your players have to be the biggest leaders, if the coach is the only leader on a team, you're probably not going to have a great team. But if you've got some guys on your team, I don't care if it's high school, that really want to lead and galvanize. Because there's an alpha male and there's a, someone that's in every group from junior high on up. And all of a sudden, you know, if they can keep the group together by teaching and emphasizing the right things, that's that internal leadership. And if you can get those people. So, you know, when we had the Piston, the great Piston teams, we had six leaders on the team out of 12 players. It's insane. Hmm. You know, some were vocal. Some just did the right thing. Uh, some guys were the guys that all they would do was call out the superstars. Rodman was the best. He would tell Isaiah and them, you ain't superstar. You're not showing up today. <laughs> now, if Chuck or I said that, we would be fired. But he, he told them it was okay because that yeah. was the best defensive player and rebounder in the league. Yeah. So they couldn't say anything to him. But that group became good because they would they would really police each other. Mm. Right? And, that, and that's when you have a good group, a good family, etc. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.